Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 1, Jacob McGregor. Jacob, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. No problem, Chris. This is going to be fun. Looking forward to it. It's interesting to be on this side of the microphone, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I, I start all my interviews with the same question for all city council candidates. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? I, that, that's that been instilled in me since I was very young. Um, growing up, I was always taught by my folks and even my friends that that's, that's something we should all strive to be, to be doing. And I was always that advanced placement, social studies model, UN kind of kid. So this was a natural place for me to um, make my community better. Well, it, you can make your community better in multiple ways. One way that you've decided to do that is to run for council for Ward 1. Um, talking about politics for a second, was politics something discussed at the kitchen table as a child or did it come, oh, are you sort of the oddball day, out? <laughs> every day, um, me, me and dad especially, mom a little less so, although she was sort of um, pushed into the conversation because she was <laughs> immersed in it by my dad and me. But yeah, it was, it was definitely something that was a regular topic of conversation in our house. Um, uh, on your website, uh, as I did the pre-interview be before we did the interview, uh, this interview, I, I looked at your website and I'm going to ask you the two questions that you get asked usually first off. Why now? Why in 2021 is Jacob McGregor running for Ward 1 City Council this year? Oh, the why now? Well, <laughs> for, for the first, uh, part of that, I, I felt, uh, very unheard, very taken for granted by my current counselor. And I felt like there needed to be a much bigger emphasis on first and foremost communication and community outreach at a grassroots level. And also um, more of a focus on practical and sort of everyday solutions as opposed to these big grandiose amorphous strategies that you hear a lot of great words and rhetoric about but it doesn't help your family around that kitchen table discussing politics so um you, you mentioned one thing that is uh close to my heart, communications, 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 uh, successful candidates and successful counselors know how to communicate. Um, how do you see yourself changing the communication style as a counselor? If you are the successful candidate on, on October 18th, right, right now, um, you get your monthly written ward one update newsletter either in your email or in in the mail if you're still getting the snail mail version <laughs> um but not everybody either knows that these newsletters exist or wants to read through them all the time so but that's not to say it won't still exist if i am elected i'm still gonna do that but I'd also like to continue doing something I started during the campaign, and that's my um, weekly and right now twice weekly podcast, Your Neck of the Woods, where I feel like I can get um, that information out in a different way. This pandemic has changed the name of campaigning, uh, communicating, getting the word out there. But you are still doing it. Uh, you are still active campaigning. It, uh, I follow you on social media and you are actively campaigning. What are you hearing at the doorstep? What are you hearing? Because you said you got into this for better communications. Your voice wasn't being heard. 
Are you hearing the same thing at the doorsteps in Ward 1? Oh, I am. I'm hearing that people are feeling kind of ignored. They'll um, try and engage with our counselor right now. And if they hear back at all, it's eight weeks later. And usually some pre-written, seemingly, response that doesn't actually help solve your issue. Now, I have heard from a minority of people who have had good experiences engaging with our counselor, and that can't be denied either. But when the ratio's about 80-20, that's probably not a good thing. (laughs) And then it's just, it's small issues, though. It's like we some people want a local police station up closer to where they live some people are really passionate like me about a properly staffed fire station because we have a brand new fire station up here in Tuscany in Ward 1 but it's on floating staff and they have to call in vehicles from other parts of the city depending on the call and that's just not safe and then even things like snow removal as somebody with a with a physical disability i'm trapped in the house essentially unless i take a vehicle obviously for weeks after any kind of snow event cuz even when the roads are plowed um the windrows Those big giant piles at the side block all the curb cuts. And that's just not safe. And it's not fair for accessibility. And it's it's these little things that we're not thinking about that are affecting people every day. Does your background and do you bring a unique perspective to council if you are the successful candidate on October 18th? that this council has been lacking because uh, I I was looking at your resume and your resume is chock full of amazing uh, community organizations that you've been on. uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Advocacy group. Do you believe your background and your uh, thinking is a different way that needs to be done in the next five years, next four years of council? Well, (laughs) Of course, everybody's perspective is going to bring something, but obviously um, being first a young person and then somebody with a disability, those are both things when you're looking at a municipal um, governing body that you don't see very much, and that's going to lend itself not only to emphasis on things like the accessibility issue but uh, again different ways of communicating and hopefully as somebody who's maybe less jaded less stuck in their ways more willing to collaborate with their colleagues that kind of thing um I, I, I'm relatively new to Calgary. I've only been here for two years, but I speak to my neighbors and I have friends in Ward 1. I have friends down in Ward 12. I have friends all across the city. Um, and what I hear from them is this council is disorganized. They are. There's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of rhetoric being spewed across the table. And they feel like they're not being heard. You've mentioned that in the first few minutes of the interview so far is you, you weren't being heard. Being just one counselor can't change everything. You need a majority of people to get behind you to uh, make change. How do you believe you can work with your fellow new incumbent counselors to better the atmosphere at city hall? Honestly, it's a big part of why I decided to talk to a lot of them, because you get to build these relationships before you're in a room making decisions and having these ideological debates. You can find that common ground first instead of having to um, slowly learn it and you can hit the ground running, I think, a little more easily. But even so, 
with all the experience you mentioned, I'm getting things done in a charity and volunteer context. You can't do that unless you're able to collaborate effectively with people. And you need eight votes to get anything done. That's true. Um, the other side of the issue is, if elected on October 18th, you will be there to represent Ward 1. But as anyone knows, counselors are there to represent all of Calgary. You are there to represent everyone, and you are there to represent Ward 1, but also the best interests for the city. Are you comfortable going back to Ward 1 if you are the successful candidate and saying, right now we can't fix this sidewalk, we have to worry about this area because it's in worse shape than other areas. Are you comfortable doing that? There, there's circumstances where you're going to have to be comfortable doing that. And it'll be, I hope I, I hope I don't have to do it um, too much because I, I view this whole process as one giant job interview. And yep. the people that are hiring me are obviously the people whose needs I would want to focus on more. However, as you said, there are projects that are going to affect the whole city or multiple wards at once. And in hopefully rare circumstances, this will mean uh, deferring uh, these smaller on the ground community level issues at the same time when you need to make that choice you need to be able to explain why you're making that choice and right now we're not getting that things just don't happen well, it, it, the reason I ask that question is because, again, looking on your website, you have uh, about seven videos there about introducing yourself and main priorities that you have. One of them is you talk about how Ward 1 is relatively the oldest neighborhood ward in the city. It, it contains some of them. It contains some, some of them. them. I apologize. And you you talk about how things are falling apart in your ward. Sidewalks aren't re being repaired. And if they are, they're taking weeks or potentially months to get fixed. Correct? Yes. If you look at older neighborhoods like Bowness and things especially, you're going to end up with these longer wait times or projects that have been sitting on 311s desk let's say for weeks months years whatever it is and that's got to stop how do you stop that how do you stop that when you're thinking at a when you're when you have to look at the big picture is it just putting your foot down and saying enough's enough and ward one needs to be heard well well we we gotta look at it from a couple of different ways if you start dealing with these smaller things more efficiently you get you lower the pressure on the 311 service because they're not having to consistently field these calls and you're able to deal with more things at once. However, um, you are very much correct that the big picture still exists once again. And in order to get these things done, or to say, renovate an amateur sports facility, because we have some of the older um, amateur sports facilities in the city up here in the Northwest as well. Um, you may have to collaborate, say, with my neighbors in two, four, and seven to make this a more of a Northwest sort of quadrant project and have more, more authority that way. Understandable. Um, we talked about what you're hearing at the doorstep. Uh, this global pandemic has changed the name of our, our recovery that we were trying to recover from, from the economic downturn that was uh, the oil prices getting closed up, uh, or shrinking, and then uh, people leave, or businesses leaving Calgary. 
are you hearing people on your on the, at the doorsteps talking about what's next? What's the recovery going to be like for Calgary? Oh, and there's a reason the oldest phrase in politics is it's the economy is stupid. Um, <laughs> Of course, everybody is worried about what the economy is going to look like, what business is going to look like, because it is going to look different coming out of COVID. Just the fact that we're having this conversation the way we are lends itself to a different way of doing work that I don't think is necessarily going to go away. Um, it might not be. There, there's this opinion that remote work is just going to take over the world. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's the case because the, these companies are still renting this office space, um, hopefully more so in downtown Calgary soon. Um, but they're not going to want to do that and have all their employees working remotely. Understandable. That's the business side of it, but the people side of it. Residents are hurting. And I think you and I will both agree that um, this, this uh, pandemic has caused financial hardship for families across this city. What can city council do on day one of the next administration to help people who are financially hurting from this pandemic? Well, the way you help people who are hurting today, and unfortunately, there's not really a today solution. Unlike the federal government, we <laughs> can't just um, have these response benefit type programs however if you um if you are able to attract more business and more events to the city say when we finish the event center project make calgary somewhere that people want to go to again that's gonna help these people worried about their bills and i i know several of them um in the hospitality industry especially my goodness are they ever hurting and the way to get those guys more business is to bring people into the city again so how do we do that is it a change of uh dynamics is it a change of uh uh, opinion that people have on Calgary because when when I first moved to Calgary the thought was oh it's a desolate town the downtown core is vacant because everyone left how do you change that narrative to make people want to come back to uh, Calgary again well right now right now there's nothing to do downtown really um so if and I, I identify as fiscally conservative. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because when you hear that, a lot of people assume that we don't want to build any capital projects or anything like that. Uh, no, the, these are the economic drivers of a city. Yep. We still have to city build. Um, we have to do it without racking up a debt that's going to make you faint every time you open up your property tax bill but um you must have been watching me while i opened up mine projects. this year sorry i said you must have been watching me open up my tax bill this year because i oh, always exactly. fainted when i got and my <laughs> what, what what what's funny is we get these we get these uh tax bills and it'll it'll go up and then you'll get that little attachment that's like, see how little your taxes went up. But what's funny about that is when it goes up a little bit consistently, you get little bitted to death over the course of 10 years. So that is one area that the next council is going to have to look at uh, 
uh, drastically is the budget. The budget is going to be passed in November. It's the first major decision that the new council. Yeah. Will... Hey, fun times for your budget <laughs> as soon Ex- as I get in. Exactly. Um, cost of ev- cost of things go up. I think you and I will agree that inflation happens no matter what it is, whether it be one percent, two percent, three percent. Um, are you in favor of keeping the increases to taxes at zero or at the co- uh, the rise of inflation? Because you do not, you cannot say that it's going to be zero without cutting. And if you say zero, I'm going to say where where are you going to cut? So, what's your views on the budget? Well, eventually, and I'm hoping it's either at the end of my term or not in my first term, we will have to do those inflationary increases again. Um, However, to keep everybody's taxes as low as possible for as long as possible and to find a more efficient way of doing things, I'd like to see a across the board service review um, across the corporation. Because, and I don't necessarily, hopefully, it's not direct service cuts and it will never be from me with regards to police and fire. But I'm hoping that most of the efficiencies we do find are in administration and bureaucracy. Um, And then once we do this um, cross the board efficiency, Jack, I would like to also um, change the way we do our building permits to um, bring in more money every time um, development projects are built. Um, you mentioned you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Because taxes are the first thing people think about. But if you can, if you can find other revenue sources, then you don't have to raise that money. So understandable. But you did mention one thing, and I want to talk about it quickly because it is the uh, topic of a conversation for a lot of people across the city: policing. Policing has been a big topic of discussion uh, since I would say about June of last year. Um, oh, for a good reason. Exactly. We are seeing this city council play nickel and dime with the uh, police budget, whether we're going to increase it, whether we're going to reallocate different money to a different location. What is your opinion on how we can help our police service better uh serve the people that it is there to protect i think well for starters i will say i think defund to fund (laughs) was a inflammatory name for this particular organization because when a lot of us here defund the police we think of instances in the states where that means Uh, potentially disbanding the police department, which is ridiculous, in my (laughs) opinion. And I actually, it's funny, you have this conversation and a lot of people see it as black and white. I've actually talked to uh, people from the Calgary Police Association um, where they said, we have to talk about what this conversation actually means because ultimately the goal is to um still enforce the law while serving the community and there's many services that cps provides like pact and depact and um the various crisis teams and school resource officers and programs like this that would be affected if you did reduce the CPS budget. Um, so ultimately, and that's, that's why I have in my platform an emphasis on um, not only 
um, emergency services, but mental health as well. Because if we can reduce the number of people reaching that crisis point and make their first point of contact something other than the police department, then we can reduce any sort of, well, a lot of difficult incidents that the police maybe aren't the best trained to handle. You just mentioned literally the best segue I've ever had set up for me is mental health. Mental health has been a big topic that, of your campaign. You dedicated an episode of your podcast. Um, you talk about it in a few of your videos. Um, this economic downturn and this pandemic has shone a light onto the mental health issues that are facing the city. Residents are uh, tired. They're frustrated that they're not, they don't have a job. How can the city uh, of Calgary and the next council help people with their mental health? You talked about it briefly there for a few seconds, but elaborate a little bit more on it. Yeah. So I have two, two big practical mental health uh, solutions that I'm advocating for. And a lot of it has to do with knowing where to start, whether it's the person seeking help or their loved ones trying to get them help. Oftentimes, when you're in these crisis scenarios, you don't know where to start. And I looked at um, things that you could search on, like Alberta Health Services, and it was incredibly lacking. All it was was basically a drop-down list of things which is less than helpful when you're stressed. Um, so what I'd like to see is a um, curated online portal, um, either on calgary.ca or some people have suggested making it its own website, like a place to start.ca or something like that, where you can search through service providers in Calgary by cost, um, your symptoms, and program availability. And that would give a lot of people a great jumping off point to the help they can get and what is available and at what cost. And then speaking of cost, I'd like to see a pilot program with the province similar to that of the low income transit pass where we um, take away cost at least somewhat as a barrier to mental health services for low income Calgarians. Are you hearing that that's a need or is this something, a policy that you, you've you come up with yourself? Because usually policies are come, come from an, a place of uh, talking to residents. So are you the, hearing that this could be a potentially a good thing for uh, low income? The, 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 we'll start the pilot the, I'll start with the portal solution because that, yeah. um, that was something that both came from um, a relative of mine that works in the South Calgary Health Campus with the people in these crisis situations, as well as um, neighbors and friends and other people that have said when they get in these situations where they're looking for help, they don't know where to go. And then... Um, and I've had some some personal experience as well with some people close to me. We won't get into that too much, but understandable. Um, from that personal experience as well, this is definitely something that's needed. And then with the the um, subsidy, I guess you would call it. Um, that's that's just more of a a numbers thing statistically the majority of people that are going to need this help have trouble affording it so they end up in these situations we were talking about before where they can't get the help 
until they're at a crisis point, and then their first contact is with our emergency services. Understandable. Um, that's a seg. It's going to be a segue because we're about thirty minutes, and I, like I said, we're going to try to keep this to forty minutes. But put on your magic hat. Consider yourself the newly elected councillor for Ward One. You are sworn in on day one. What is your first priority? What is number one priority for Jacob McGregor? I would. Well, there's a couple of things I'd like to get the the mental health portal project kicked off. I want to introduce a notice of motion to do the cross the board service review. I and one we haven't talked about yet is I am advocating for a 10% rollback in salary for council and administration, as well as and then to supplementary pensions. So I'd like to uh, kick that around with my colleagues as well. That, that's going to be an interesting conversation because that's going to mean convincing eight of us to take pay cuts. Um, but we need to start leading by example. Like you said, so many people are suffering and they don't see a freeze of already high council and administration salaries as really any kind of sacrifice. And so are you saying that you would not take a pension if, uh, if when elected? I, I'm, I'm, what I will guarantee right now is I will donate 10% of my salary. I will um, not be taking the transition allowance. Hopefully, we change the retirement benefits to more of an RRSP style. Um, if we don't, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, but I will definitely not take the transition allowance. Perfect. Um, let's let's talk about the campaign a little bit. Like we said a little bit beforehand, COVID-19 has changed the name of politics. You are not campaigning the way that traditionally every other campaign has ever been run in this uh, country. Um, how are you connecting with the voters? How can people get in touch with you? How can people learn a little bit more about you? Um, go on YouTube, go on my website. Like you said, all my uh platform videos all the podcast episodes are there um you can find those at jacob for ward one on youtube uh jacob for ward one dot ca um spotify basically anywhere you'd get a podcast you can download the podcast it's called your neck of the woods um I am going to be doing some virtual events with some other candidates. One of them is on June 7th and one is on June 14th. Um, I, we, me and my team are going to be getting back to the doors. We, um, we recently shut down canvassing activities when we were uh, doing Stop the Spike. We went back to doing just lit drops with door hangers. Now we're going to be starting to knock on doors again soon. I'm going to be at um, farmers markets, community association meetings, because as somebody with mobility difficulties, traditional door knocking, even when we don't have COVID, is a bit of a challenge when stairs are my natural enemy. Uh, so I'm gonna- So, so just on those notes- the community as much as possible. Awesome. So just on those notes, for my listeners and the viewers, uh, uh, the links to Jacob's Facebook website, uh, YouTube channel, and his podcast will be in the show notes. So please check it out. I highly recommend it. Like I said, I've listened to his podcast and I've listened, I've just seen a few of his videos. They are incredible. I would highly recommend sitting down and taking a few minutes and actually listening to them. Um, but before we do start wrapping up, I have one last big question for you. And this is the question I love to ask because it tells me how prepared you are as the potential next candidate, next counselor for Ward 1. 
why should you be the next counselor for Ward 1? I've been working to serve my community, volunteer-wise or otherwise, for most of my life. This is, this is something that means a lot to me. We can do better, and I know how to collaborate to make that happen. This is about real solutions for everyday people. Where I'm, you're not going to get a lot of talk and no action from me. I answer questions on email every day already, like I, as if I were the counselor already. And I am ready to not only answer your questions, but to turn those answers into actual solutions for you. And I can't wait to do it. Awesome. Jacob, uh, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been enlightening. Um, uh, greatly appreciate it to my listeners. Like I said beforehand, the links to his website, Facebook page, social media uh, are in the show notes. Look at, check them out if you're in Ward 1. Even if you're not, you can, I, I, I see that you can request a sign. You can join his team if you want to get it in campaign. So Jacob, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. This was excellent.